Hello and welcome to episode 328 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I am one of the co-founders here at ETR and we are coming off of a fantasy specific beat writers would have saved us kind of week. Yes, that's right. The key to the slate. I mean, uh, at least the Sunday only slate. The key to that slate was Gio Bernard and Jarek McKinnon. And getting these these kind of things wrong, you know, is the most tilting to me. You know, I'm really unfazed by, you know, bad runouts, bad performances, bad game theory things, whatever. But man, getting the usage wrong in spots like Tampa backfield and spots like Kansas City backfield, I mean, that's really, really tilting to me. And, and could we have seen this coming? Maybe. I, I mean, we know the Bucks don't think very highly of Keyshawn Vaughn. They've done everything they can since drafting him to not use him. Um, we also know Gio Bernard is like a legit NFL player, especially on pass downs. So Gio ahead of Dust Ball, Le'Veon Bell in third down in two minute. Yeah, I kind of expected that. But Gio got a ton of base work. I mean, even early in the game, Gio got a bunch of base work, finished with 13 carries, 36 snaps. You know, that surprised me, especially since he hadn't played since week 14 due to a knee injury. And on McKinnon, you know, yeah, Daryl Williams had the toe issue, but he got in three practices last week. You know, they were all limited, but still. I mean, Jerick McKinnon hadn't played more than 27 snaps in a game all year, has dealt with so many injuries throughout his career, including major knee ones. And then he just pops off for 51 snaps against the Steelers. Again, it's not the pass down work that surprised me. It's the base work. You know, and Daryl was healthy enough to run trick plays or whatever. He gets benched for whatever that was, bungle, fumble, just disaster. By the way, it's so ridiculous. I've been losing money on Jerk McKinnon for like seven years. Like one of the faces of the Spark movement and all the jokes around Spark and everything. I mean, this dude was an athletic freak and was so, so good as a receiver. You know, like the perfect profile for full PPR DFS. You know, so maybe should have given him more credence in that game. So, so look, you know, I take full responsibility for both. No excuses. Play like a champion. But man, I, I can't help but think if I had my way and we had a fantasy beat writer for each team, you know, not a team reporter. You know, no one cares about which fucking laundry wins the stupid game. I mean, a fantasy slash gambling beat writer whose only job is to find this stuff out. Oh, hey, is Daryl Williams taking first team reps in practice this week? Are they thinking about using Jerry McKinnon in base? Is Gio Bernard ready to handle 18 touches in his first game back? These are not questions that a team beat reporter would ask. These are questions that a fantasy slash gambling beat reporter would ask. You know, I, I couldn't give a flying fuck about some beat writer's opinion of how Baker Mayfield's accuracy is looking in practice. I do need to know if Dearness Johnson's role will be the same as Kareem Hunt's was when Kareem Hunt is out or lower, you know, so... Maybe. One day, man. One day. Uh, I do want to get to the listener questions quickly here today, but I do have to mention this this Bart Scott thing. So I, I'm sure most of you saw the video by now. Um, it's from that ESPN show, Get Up. I, I don't know. I've never seen uh, the show, but I guess it's their morning show. So it's Diana Rossini, Bart Scott, Louis Riddick, and, and I think Damian Woody. And they're going through this stupid narrative, this insanely small sample narrative that Josh Allen can't play in the cold, you know, which of course makes no, no sense, right? Like every quarterback sucks when it's zero degrees, or at least every quarterback is significantly worse than if it's in a dome when it's in conditions. There's no reason for Josh Allen to be bad in cold weather. But anyways, Bart Scott just, they're talking about this and Bart Scott just goes for it, man. He goes like Rossini asked him a question and he says like, Josh Allen, if you're listening, let me give you this tip, Viagra. And he says, you know, a lot of us take Viagra. NFL players, a lot of us take Viagra because it opens up the blood vessels. And Damian Woody is just in the background, just, just dying. And Bart Scott has this like very serious face on. I mean, I am so here for this kind of awkward shit in mainstream media. Like first the ass eating with Paps Blue Ribbon a couple weeks ago, and now Viagra discussion on ESPN. I mean, Lewis Riddick was like the most uncomfortable human I've ever seen on screen. It was so, so good. If you guys haven't seen it, you got to check it out. All right. Uh, on these off-season solo pods, I'm typically going to keep the intros relatively short. Focus on questions from you guys mostly. By the way, 
I know NFL is winding down. I plan to relax a little after this divisional slate and then get back in the NBA streets for props for DFS. If you're interested, our DFS and props packages on EstablishedRun.com are indeed separate. You can sign up for one or the other. We also have a bundle that combines both props and DFS on the NBA side for the cheapest price. We've reduced that price as a post-NFL sale, so check it out. Okay, enough is enough. Let's get to everyone's favorite portion of the program, the listener questions. Producer Luke, hit the theme music. All right, question one comes from Jordan Sandberg. He says, hey, Adam, was wondering how it was for you when your kids were newborn slash infants between the lack of sleep, working full time, grinding NFL, and drastic reduction in appearances on the hashtag team. It's been a rewarding, but sometimes tough year plus for me. I have 16 month old twins. Yeah, Jordan, I'd say the world is just full of stone cold liars, man. Stone cold liars. Uh, They say, oh, this baby, it's a blessing, this baby. Oh, this is this is the most amazing time of my life. I have these feelings I, I've never felt before. Uh, my, my whole outlook on life has changed. You know, cut the fucking shit, man. Having a newborn fucking blows, period. End of story. You know, I, I remember my older son was probably three weeks old. And one of my wife's friends comes to visit us and to meet the kid or whatever. And she just asked me in passing just to be nice. Uh, you know, how's it going? And I'm sure she expected me to be like every other lemming and give her the, oh, it's great. You know, b- being a dad is just just so special. But when she asked, she said, how's it going? And I said, man, it fuck, it's fucking awful. It sucks. I mean, her face just lit up with shock. She was clearly so appalled. She, she just wasn't ready for the truth, you know? Jack Nicholson, she couldn't handle the truth. Um, Honestly, the hardest part for me wasn't uh, sleep or wiping feces out of an asshole six times a day. You know, I had gloves for that. Obviously, it was fine. Um, it wasn't lack of being on the team or, or, or whatever. The, the hardest part for me was simply freedom. You know, I had a pretty incredible life at that time, you know, mostly from poker, just, you know, do whatever I want, whatever I want, just freedom to take trips or, or go drinking at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday or, or whatever, you know, just, and then just one day you wake up and it's all over. And, and that was tough for me, man. Like I used to joke that, that I had uh, part postpartum depression, but you know, as always in life, I just wish people would be honest. I think the most rewarding times for when people have kids is when they're older, you know, like every day they get older, it gets better for sure. You can do more adult things with them, but you know, people who say that sitting in your house, you know, trapped in your house, watching this little fucker crawl around and shit himself is some great thing. I mean, these people are, are deranged, you know, it's so incredibly boring and miserable and, and that's the truth. And, and I hope, uh, uh, Jordan, you can take something from that in that you're not alone. It's okay to say that it sucks. Question two from the hard 17. He says, I know you hand build GPP lineups, but generally speaking, when you guys talk about fading a player in GPPs, does that mean play zero of him or just less than his projected ownership? Yeah, for me personally, when I'm only making five to eight tournament teams per week, a fade for me typically means I won't play him at all. And again, I think when you're playing cash seriously, you can feel when someone gets overowned and the floor is lower than people think. So if I'm like, man, you know, I don't know about Michael Pittman in cash this week. You know, the floor is low, but I'll play him in cash to make other stuff work. Well, if we go over to tournaments and his projected ownership is 30% or even 20%, I mean, it's just a stone cold, no brainer fade, right? I think when people get into the underweight, overweight stuff, it's more for optimizer and MME, aka mass multi-entry. Like if Cooper Cup is going to be 30% and I have 150 lineups, well, going with zero cup out of 150, I think is typically wrong relative to his ceiling. So getting 15 cup lineups out of 150 while you're still making a stand against the field, but you're not drawing dead if he's in the optimal. But, you know, I'm talking out of my lane here. You know, Dink is our professional MME bro, and he has tons of videos and articles up for free on the site and on YouTube for those interested. Question three comes from great friend of the show, Mark Weiser. He says, how did you transition from fantasy football advice to sex jokes on the internet? Yeah, so Mark is like 66 years old or something. He is my good friend Josh's dad. 
Uh, great guy. Uh, fucking maniac, actually. He, w- he was texting me about ass eating the other day. Just ridiculous. But anyway, funny story. So, so my first job out of college was at a place called the Sports Network. It was kind of a, a wire service type place based in the suburbs of Philly. I was making like 24K a year. And of course, even at that pathetic salary, I didn't last a year because they fired me after four months. They claimed they were you know, downsizing or whatever. More, more likely, they just hated me. But I really wasn't too worried about it. You know, this was late 2004, early 2005. I was playing poker two to three days a week anyways and, and doing well. You know, I wasn't too, too worried about money at that point in my life. But I was worried about just like letting my parents down. I have so much guilt about that. And it's also like so humiliating to get fired from a 24K a year job. But anyways, you know, I just had so much guilt about letting my parents down. So I, I couldn't face... Well, it was hard for me to face telling them I got fired four months into my first real job, but I I couldn't face telling them that, you know, my new plan was to just like grind my cock off playing poker against DJs every day. So I told my parents that I got a job at Vitalink and Vitalink was Mark's, Mark Weiser's here company. It's a medical alarm company, uh, by the way, if you're need in your, if you are in need of services, uh, check them out for sure. But, but anyway, I told my parents I got a job at Vitalink. You know, and thankfully, Mark never had to vouch for that. Um, meanwhile, while I was allegedly working at Vitalink, uh, I was actually at Borgata, you know, living there, playing poker. Uh, of course, I never actually worked a day at Vitalink, but Mark still says I was the best employee he ever had, and, and I actually believe that. But anyway, back to the question. How did I transition from, from fantasy football advice to sex jokes on the internet? So I, I honestly wouldn't say that it's been like a a conscious decision. I started asking for listener questions when I was doing the solo pods back when we started Daily Fantasy Edge for DraftKings in 2015. And at first, you know, the questions were pretty tame, boring, you know, micro stuff about DFS or whatever. But then I I got a few absurd ones and I answered them. And I think that kind of just fed into itself, right? Like the sick fucks started coming out of the woodwork, asking all kinds of disturbing questions, trying to one up each other and stuff and see what I would answer. Um, but I think more to the point is that I'm a sick fuck. Like I I try to be as honest as I can on here, but I can assure you that I'm much sicker in real life. I don't find many comedians funny, but man, I love Anthony Jeselnik. Like this dude is so sick that I don't even want to bring up what he makes jokes about because just mentioning it will probably get me canceled. Um, so anyway, I'd say two things first, like It's so obvious to me, sex and money are the topics deep down most people care about, you know, I think. And second, I'd say that like, I'm very, very far from the best DFS player in the world. I'm very, very far from the best, you know, hand in the dirt football bro in the world. But no one wants to listen to some lecture from a, you know, Princeton professor about standard deviations and and machine learning in DFS. So like, I do think we have the best fantasy and DFS information and projections like by a mile, not even close. But I also think we can try to be entertaining along the way. So, you know, leaning into some of the joke stuff, I think um, makes sense. Question four from Billy Baru. He says, what's the number one team smell the roses activity trip adventure you're looking forward to with the family in the off season? Thanks for all your hard work. It's much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks, Billy. Um, I mean, my kids right now are six and three. They're about to be seven and four. It's really tough to do cool adventures with them at this age. Like I know in theory, we could bring them on like the rafting trip I want to do through the Grand Canyon. But in reality, like that's just not going to work. So for me personally, you know, things I, I want to do, definitely looking to some, forward to some adventures. I'm going to do my first 14,000 foot peak, hopefully with draft sheet. Uh, we did Bear Peak in Boulder a few months ago. That's only 8,500 feet, but I actually felt like I was going to die. Like, so who knows if I can make it up something like Mount Bierstadt or some other 14 foot peak, but, but we're going to try. Uh, by the way, these climbing documentaries, like I can't stop watching them. I still think Free Solo is the best one by a pretty wide margin, but 14 Peaks was, was really, really good. And, and the Alpinist was decent too. Also, in terms of adventures, I'll be turning 40 uh, in September. Going to try to do a big trip in the summer before training camp starts. Um, 
you know, of course, with the kids, uh, you know, staying behind, I can't leave for very long, probably have to stay in the United States, you know, only so long my parents or whoever can stay with them. But yeah, you know, if anyone has ideas for a sick, sick 40th birthday trip in the United States, uh, let me know. I've been pitched on Napa, which seems okay to me, but, but maybe a little boring. So yeah, open to ideas there. Question five from Matthew. He says, please provide a basketball update and any changes to your team's championship odds. You know, I'm not sure if Matthew knows what's going on here or if he's trolling or what, but uh, I have bad news. Uh, Really bad, actually. Uh, It turns out we're in trouble. The basketball team. I mean, it's so ridiculous. We have three former Division I players on our team. In the first game, we barely squeaked out a win in our opener. Barely. And the second game, I can't even believe I'm admitting this, but in the second game, we got mercy ruled. I mean, just absolutely humiliating. So if you're down by 2x in the second half, they just end the game. We were down 62-31 in the second half. Ref just blows the whistle. Game over. I mean, maybe the most embarrassing moment of my extremely mediocre athletic career. It's just mind-blowing to me, like, how good the guys are in this league. Like, we're in the stone-cold suburbs of Denver. It's just shocking. But really, you know, no excuses. It's it's on me, man. Like, I just really suck now. It's crazy. Like, it's just like the way you would think about gambling. Like, where is my edge, you know? And when I was growing up in high school, et cetera, my edge was being, you know, the fastest, the quickest, you know, most heart. And now that I'm so old, I'm just so bad because like without this speed edge that I had, like it's so, so, so bad. So... I think next year I'm going to join the 40 and over league, which may be more embarrassing than getting mercy ruled by a bunch of shit talking college kids. But, you know, so be it. Uh, The time has come. Question six from Jake. He says, will your profile picture ever become an NFT? If so, what would the asking price be? Yeah, Jake, I got to tell you, the NFT bros, they already got me, man. At first, I'm not sure if you remember, but Ashley Jennings, Peter's wife, took a picture of me currently and up next to it, she had a picture of her phone, which had pulled up a picture of my profile picture. So, and then she tweeted it out, you know, I called it double the sex, whatever. It was funny, but some sick fuck turned it into an NFT called double the sex and put it on OpenSea. And I think it actually sold. And then some other sick fuck named their Zed horse, Adam Levitan, you know, like on Zed, you can have your horses fuck. And then if you own the female, you get to name the baby and keep the baby. They named their baby Adam Levitan, their baby horse, Adam Levitan, and then put me in the breeding barn to fuck. I mean, insane. So, so look, I do believe that the underlying technology for NFTs is truly society changing, but 99.9% of the projects out there are like straight money grabs. And like, I'm just not going to partake in that you know i'm not gonna sell an nft of my profile picture and squeeze the audience for something valueless you know the whole idea here is to always provide people value whether it's information or entertainment or or, or whatever question seven from bad homie he says this girl i know got smashed by debo samuel after finding out i felt really insecure i feel debo sets a really high bar that i will never be able to live up to as a result i can't put debo into a dfs lineup without feeling ashamed how do you overcome personal biases and emotions? Yeah, it's over, bad homie. I mean, I agree with you. You can never have the sex with this girl again. I mean, did you see the video of the 49ers coming out of the locker room in Dallas? They got the beatbox dude with the huge stereo on his shoulder, you know, Debo and Trent Williams in the front leading the way. Like, I don't think that this should have any effect on your DFS lineups though. Like the whole reason why you can't have the sex with that girl anymore is because Debo has max swag, max alpha, but that's exactly why you can play him in DFS. So yeah, hope that makes sense. All right. Question eight. Last question we do take comes from Alan. He says, is there any situation in which you would use a communal shower naked at your local gym or YMCA? I have thought about this question for 20 years and have yet to come up with an accept- acceptable situation. Oh man, Alan, you're thinking about this all wrong, buddy. Uh, the gym I went to back in Philly was about, I don't know, it was only like 110 a month and they let you see all the old naked men in the locker room. And I showered communal nude there all the time, like almost every day. The WeWork I had 
was actually in the same building as the gym, so it was perfect. Work out, get to see some shriveled balls, shower up, go to work. I mean, it's the American dream, man. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Solo Pod. I'll be back later tonight with Silva for Team by Team. See you then. For Bruce Luke, for Jerry, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.